the impact. As a matter of fact, the impact rule kind of leads into this other email. And what you just said about Mr. Dreamer, who's apparently dreaming. Uh, Nick, whose last name I cannot pronounce, writes, Dear Jim, as you have been discussing the longevity of wrestlers in the territories and contrasting that with the high spot monkeys in AEW, well, he says AEW, but all the high spot monkeys everywhere. It's just the most noted zoo. Uh, this got me to thinking about the owners of promotions and their respective backgrounds. Do you think that the safety of the work in the ring has any correlation to ownership having been one of the boys? To put it another way, if Tony Khan were superplexed off the balcony of an arena into a flaming table covered with broken glass and then thrown into a body bag filled with poisonous snakes, would he be willing to allow his wrestlers to do potentially career-ending moves for no reason? Well, yes, probably, because I'm sure Tony Khan would have got a thrill of, of, uh, out of all of that, because they're all marks. But here, in all seriousness, as an answer to this question, the very reason why that wrestling boomed, especially in the territories, but for so many years, was because the wrestlers, yes, were in charge of the companies, were mostly ex-wrestlers, or there was a heavy... If the promoter wasn't Sam Muchnick, Jim Crockett, his booker was, right? There was a heavy veteran wrestling influence. And the thing they knew, and it was a fact, was that the ridiculous death-defying qualities of bumps or moves or whatever had no place in matches unless it was the climactic point, and even then a calculated risk, and the believability of the match and whether the people supported the baby face and were mad at the heel, those things were all way more important. You would always have guys, Ray Stevens, Chris Colt, the fucking lunatic bumpers. And most of the lunatic bumpers in those days got away with it because they were taking the bumps, not giving them. So they weren't, they weren't fucking giving a guy a bump that he didn't want to fucking take or have any reason to feel like taking. They were taking them themselves and those crazy bumpers. For whatever reason, those bumps they took because they could take those bumps without really getting hurt. I mean, uh, it, it's cumulative, yes, but injuring themselves right there. How many times did you see Terry Funk just suddenly get fucking popped and just collapse backwards through the ropes and fall straight out of the ring on his fucking head on the concrete. It looked like, cause that was a bump he could take. So he took it all the time. Somebody else trying that would have broke their fucking neck. But it, so yes, the ownership played a part because the guy, the people in control were veterans of the wrestling industry and knew don't go too far. They remember the famous story when Roy Shire came in, told Pat Patterson to Ray Stevens after they had the greatest tag team match ever seen in San Francisco. Don't ever fucking do that again. You fucking idiots. You guys are going to be gone in six months. I got to promote this town for the next 10 years. Nobody can follow that shit for self-preservation for good of the business. It wasn't just trying to keep people down. If you were doing an angle with your top baby face where he had gotten a, a, a certain move or a certain thing done to him and was hospitalized and was going to come back and get revenge, and you were going to draw big money off of it. You didn't want a guy in a third match taking the same fucking bump. It, it was all about business and prolonging everybody's ability to be in it for both themselves and others uh, for, and, and for the company. But now... Even if it's a veteran wrestler, as we just did, Tommy Dreamer fits the category of veteran wrestler, and he's out there doing dinner theater murder mysteries. And we've got, uh, we'll talk about it on the brief AEW review that we do later on, but you've got Dusty Rhodes' son doing a superplex off the top rope into fucking 15 people that are going to catch him. I still say, you know what? These motherfuckers coming off the top rope, I'm walking away. Because there's a lot of knees, elbows, heads, and hard bones coming at a high rate of speed. And that's not even taken into account when you're in the middle of 10 guys reaching up to catch somebody. You got a lot of fucking arms and elbows up over your face. 
and these constant fucking dives for no reason other than than to do them that nobody's going to remember the next day and except when they see the clip on Twitter or somebody reminds them about it the next week it's completely gone because they're doing something else somebody's going to get their fucking face reconstructed surgically off of just catching one of these idiots so anyway the way it was in the old days in wrestling yes the way it is now the boys are the bigger fucking uh, uh, in, uh, infringers on the standard rule of wrestling, which is make it look good, don't make it real. This stuff doesn't look good, and it's real at the same time. You can't fucking defy gravity. Gravity is a harsh mistress. So, as a promoter, yeah, I didn't ask people to do things that I w either hadn't done or wouldn't do if I could. I never did a fucking drop kick, right? But there's, you know, you get the flavor. And and if somebody wanted to do something, there's many Chris Chris Candido talked me into doing a couple of things that I that I didn't think he should do and didn't encourage him to do. Jericho didn't consult with me before he did one thing that he really shouldn't have fucking done, cost him a lot of fucking pain and money. <clears throat> and there, uh, that's the thing. Today's guys, they don't they don't have any restraint and they have fallen into this pattern of this is what we have to do now. So if they were running the company, which in effect they are down there in Dixie Con land, uh, they won't do anything because they're marks to their, they're bigger marks than the people sitting in the seats. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you now that used to be what contained a lot of these guys and taught them how to do things the right way. Now that's no longer the case. So no, I don't think it matters if the boys are ownership or uh, ta just talent. They're still going to do all this stupid shit because the uh, the conductor has decided to let the orchestra tell him what they're going to fucking play. In terms of things that a promoter would ask a guy to do, that's one of the things people have said about Vince is that Vince, I mean, we've seen it. He'll demonstrate what he wants you to do, even if it's something you're scared to do, like Rob Gronkowski falling off that overhang. Here's old man Vince out of his yeah. mind doing it. Shawn Michaels doing the uh, the entrance at WrestleMania 12. There's Vince yeah. McMahon doing it. I mean, that is one thing you could say about Vince. He has done these things that he wants other guys to do. Well, here, I'll give you one. Um, I promoted one scaffold match in my life. Promoted one. I was in one, but I promoted one in Smoky Mountain Wrestling between Al Snow and Ricky Morton. And they talked me into it they first came what about a scaffold match i think it was al at first said it but he'd been talking to ricky i said are you out of your fucking mind no well you did it i, said, I ain't gonna pay you fucking 10 grand to do it and but it was uh they had done that thing and it was al snow and unibom glenn jacobs against ricky and robert and they'd done the thing where al had hit ricky with three pile drivers in johnson city and we called the ambulance and the people were, guys were waiting for Al out back of the building. The girls were crying. Ricky's girlfriend, Andrea, was in there fucking holding his hand and he was, his arm was quivering. And so they're, they were going to have a single match blow off at the Volunteer Slam 95, I believe, in Knoxville. Scaffold match. And oh, come on. No, they wanted to do it. Al was going to take the bump and Ricky said he could do it safe. So I let them talk me into doing that against my better judgment. And it did draw pretty decently for our May show, which was never a, a huge one. But, you know, every once in a while, but you have to, for the most part, the boys out of wanting to do good, get over, draw a house, get attention, all the right reasons will want to do the wrong things. And the, those things should be discouraged. And the first thing I would do, and I'm glad, and I, and I know all the AEW fans are going, well, I'm so glad he's not in charge. The first thing I do is the next motherfucker that does a dive out of the ring until I tell you to is fired. Figure out how to fucking work and see if you can come up with something else to do besides the thing that everybody is doing. But they don't listen anymore. No, this is the era of the singer-songwriter. They don't listen. They tell you what they're going to do. <laughs> 
when you, you go to the restaurant and they just say, I'll tell you what you're going to eat. <laughs> That's what it is. Tony Cow's sitting at the table and these guys are all serving him whatever they feel like cooking him. And he likes it. 